We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created. Are As a member of Congress, I get to have a lot of really interesting people in the office. Experts on what they're talking about. This is the podcast. For insights into the issues. China, bioterrorism, Medicare for all. In-depth discussions. Breaking it down into simple terms. We hold. We hold. We hold these truths. We hold these truths. With Dan Crenshaw. The eagle has landed. Our next speaker is going to be um, on space medicine. Uh, this is this is uh, Dorit Donneville. Thank you so much. She's executive director at NASA Translational Research Institute for Space Health at Baylor College of Medicine. Thank you for coming. Pleasure for, uh, thanks so much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. So I have to give credit to Baylor College of Medicine. I know it says NASA, we are funded by NASA, but we belong to Baylor College of Medicine, so we are local. <laughs> So I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about you. You make sure our astronauts get excellent health care when leaving Earth. Uh, she recently produced a documentary on this endeavor, Space Health, Surviving the Final Frontier. Uh, and you're working on an understanding of what is necessary for an eventual Mars mission. So that's, this is some really cool stuff. Um, so uh, Dorit, what, what does it take to survive? Let's just talk in basics first. What does it take to survive in the final frontier? What are the health challenges in space? And how do you reduce those risks? Yeah, this is, a, I could talk for hours. So do we have a timer going? Because somebody has to get, pull the hook. OK, great. Um, so thanks for asking that. So there are basically every single uh, system in the body changes when you go into, into zero gravity. And while you're still within the protection of our atmosphere, you're protected from radiation. But once you leave our atmosphere, you go to the moon or Mars, now your body is bombarded by a lot of radiation, and unlike what they tell you on, you know, uh, in sci-fi movies, we haven't figured out the radiation problem. So there's going to be major problems for humans traveling back to the moon, and when you think about it, Mars is a really long trip. Uh, the closest Earth and Mars are is 34 million miles away, and with current propulsion, it's going to take us about six months to get there, and then you got to wait for the planet to be realigned back with Earth to be close again. So that's a year and a half, and then another six months back. So you're talking a really long time, a couple of years for that trip. And so the longer you're out there being exposed to radiation, and this is like really bad radiation, really bad radiation from planet exploding, suns exploding, all kinds of stuff, it's going to damage the body. And so the kinds of challenges that we have really kind of force us to invent new ways of keeping humans healthy. And it's the same thing as preventing cancer or preventing damage from the environment that could cause disease in you. So making humans more resilient, figuring out a way to keep us healthy. You know, Dan, um, when, when you were talking about a healthcare system, and thank you, that was really inspirational for me, I thought to myself, let's do it in space. Seriously, because it's a blank slate. We have to do everything that you're proposing for people. They're the same. Our astronauts are the same people uh, as, as you and me. We have to provide a healthcare capability, a whole healthcare system in a tin can. So if you could do it in a tin can on the way to Mars and back in a three year period, if you could figure out how to keep humans healthy in a tin can, on the way to Mars and back, you could do it on Earth. And you could do it in a whole different kind of way. Because you have to put healthcare in the hands of the astronauts. And they're not going to be doctors. They're going to be engineers. They're going to be planetary scientists. They're going to be pilots. Maybe they'll have a doctor, one doctor, one crew medical officer. That's the guy that's going to get sick, or her. You know, and then you've got, now you've got a geologist trying to do a procedure. So it's the same thing as what you're describing, putting the data, the healthcare, the insights as to how are you doing, Dan? Are you about to get sick? Let's give you something so that you don't get sick because if you have a UTI in space, that UTI, uh, urinary tract infection, okay, that can happen in zero gene, particularly scary thing. That could be life-threatening. So what you describe for a new healthcare system, we can do it in space. So I'm sorry, I didn't answer your question because I, I went off on that tangent because it just really stuck in my mind when you were describing that healthcare system. 
So there's some, a lot of challenges that we have to solve in keeping humans healthy in space. So we have to give them an ability to exercise. We have to provide a whole new way to feed them because on that three-year trip to Mars, the things that we take for granted, like fruits and vegetables, we're not gonna have that. And our bodies need all those vitamins. You're thinking, okay, let me send some vitamin pills with them. Guess what, those vitamin pills, have you ever checked? They expire after about a year. So if we've got a three-year mission to Mars and you gotta bring all your vitamins with you, by the time you need to take them, they're expired. I thought that was a myth. Did they actually expire? No, they expire, dude, throw them out. <laughs> throw them out. I don't know. Seriously. I don't believe you. Seriously. I think expiration dates are bogus. <laughs> okay, now you're really scaring me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so food's number one. Radiation is really high uh, priority. Medical capability, being able to, hey, if you, just, if you just get a simple cold in space, you're really congested, you're not able to do your job. Um, medications don't work the same. It's, it's now a real problem, so you have to be able to provide healthcare in a tin can. And then number fourth on my top list, and NASA's list as well, is mental health. Okay, so you're in a tin can. How many of you have felt like you're ready to kill everybody around you when you were locked up in the pandemic and you couldn't go out? Okay, imagine that in a tin can with three people that your boss picked out to be with you. <laughs> and you're there for three years. You're not able to go outside. You're not able to have a change in seasons. You're not able to do anything. You're not able to have a burger or a beer. So, you know, even the most resilient individuals, and these are humans that are trained for this, it's a whole other ballgame. I assume there's a lot of uh, testing prior to, is your personality well suited to deal with people in closed spaces for a very long time? Are you an agreeable person uh, for the most part? Um, Talk to me more about the radiation. That, that seems like the biggest problem that you face. I mean, I, it seems like you can figure out food and nutrition and maybe some of these other things. and and um, you know, even the psychological aspects, you can just be harder. That's what we would say in the SEAL teams, just, just deal with it. Um, but, the, but the radiation isn't something, you know, I can't run through a, a, a hail of gunfire. Uh, just like you can't deal with, so are we close? I mean, what, what tools do we have to yeah, deal with this? Yeah, it's a great question. So um, I take issue with just deal with it because it, you're talking about three years. Like a SEAL mission typically, what, is a few that's, weeks? Yeah, that's, well. Three years? Could be a year. On a mission? No, it, it's fair enough, yeah. It's, okay, it's, diff it's different. It's different. different. It's, it's very different. different. Yeah, okay. We'll come back to the behavioral health thing. I'm just saying that you can, I, okay. it seems like a problem you can wrap your hands around a little bit easier yeah. than radiation. Yeah, no, you're right. Radiation is definitely a huge challenge. So the type of radiation we're really worried about is, it's called galactic cosmic rays. It's, they sound, it, GCR for short, but this is the type of radiation. It, it's, think of, anybody remember the chemistry, the periodic table? Okay, every single element on the periodic table radioactive and coming at you at the speed of light, okay? That's what it is. So, you know, the things that are lighter, like you remember the hydrogen has like an atom, uh, a weight of one. Okay, that doesn't go very far. That's what we get from the sun. You see those beautiful things that come off the sun. Um, that, that's protons. That's just a stripped hydrogen. That doesn't go very far. Water is a great way to block that. In fact, when they were thinking about putting the moon buggies, they were gonna put the water on top so that if they get any, any massive coronal ejections from the sun, it was just gonna protect them. Iron, silicon, sodium, uh, helium, all of those things are heavier. Now you're talking about you, you can't protect for those because if you put up an inadequate shield, if you had an inadequate shield, what happens is, is that that shielding will actually take that particle, instead of the particle going through all the way and just going through you and hitting you once, it's gonna fractionate it into multiple particles. Now you've got like 10 of them hitting your body in all different parts as opposed to just one. So we don't, we, we can shield, but it's like massive amounts of material, which you can't do in space. Can't. Right, you can't carry a, a water no. shield to space, why uh, not? You could, yeah, the water's not good for those yeah. heavy particles. Right. So, okay, it still doesn't work any, even so if you So the could. way to do this is you gotta, you gotta, you gotta make people more resilient. But be harder, like I said. <laughs> <laughs> like I said.
So, so but how do we make people more resilient? That's an honest question. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we don't know yet. Well, do you? Well, well I guess. <laughs> well, then I. I, I, okay, so maybe I'll answer your question more seriously. Then the way we do it is you you break down yourself to get stronger. That's what you do. I mean, you punish someone, punish yourself, whether it's yeah, exercise routine. Yeah, that's interesting routine, you say that. And then you become more resilient. You know, it doesn't kill you, doesn't okay, make so you stronger. Now, I don't know if that's the same with radiation. <laughs> All right, so, so like here are the just, strategies. They just keep dying when we zap them with radiation. Here are the strategies, you're right. Okay, so actually there are people who think that if you expose yourself to a little bit of radiation, it boosts up your internal repair mechanisms. So here are the ways that we're approaching it. We haven't figured it out. Folks, we still have a ways to go. And actually, when we do figure it out, I really think we're gonna be able to prevent cancer. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of the damage that occurs in your body from radiation, it's, it's DNA breaks, it's, it's all kinds of products that your cells make because they're not happy. And that causes the body to go bad. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'll, give you, I'll give you some approaches that we've taken. So our institute is, is funded by NASA to do the crazy stuff, the crazy stuff, like you know, going to mattress mac kind of things, okay? But but on steroids. Um, and so what we we're actually looking at putting people into hibernation on that trip. So just like sci-fi. Yeah, yeah. And and there's actually Absolutely. precedence for this in the medical world um, when uh, you know you're undergoing like major heart or you have yeah you put people you cool them down, you cool them down. Okay, so we just, we just funded a bunch of studies looking at cooling you down while you're sleeping. So I know a lot of people who would have loved to have slept through the pandemic. So that might actually be happening at the next one. Um, so when you cool down, that means that your body is not going to be susceptible to all the damage that might be occurring. Right, really, well, why? Why wouldn't it be yeah, susceptible? Yeah, so, so the reason that, that, for example, DNA damage occurs uh, from radiation in cells like hair or the gut is that they turn over really quickly. They're constantly sloughing off and reforming. Your hair is growing, your gut's constantly making new cells. So the more active your cells are, the more likely they are to be damaged because they're undergoing uh, the, the DNA becomes more susceptible to damage. So if, if we just slow everything down, we just chill you down a little bit, um, there might be a protective effect of some of the, um, the damage from the radiation. And also, every, every time, like, you know, your heart has a certain number of heartbeats, right? And then you die, except for if you have Billy's device. Uh, and so the less wear and tear on the body, the less cellular damage you're making. So if you just chill things down a little bit, we might be able to have you last that trip longer with less damage overall. That's pretty interesting. And hopefully you can speed back up after you're slowed down. That's, that's the that's, idea. That's the hard part, that's right? That's the idea. Uh, how long can you survive in space right now? I mean, what's the time limit because of radiation at the moment? Yeah, so that's a great question. So right now our astronauts are still within the protection of our atmosphere. Now the higher up you go, the thinner the atmosphere, the less protection you get okay. from radiation. So. You know, if you live like in Denver, right? You're up higher and you do yeah, get more okay, skin get cancer in Denver, yeah. et cetera. And so um, we, we, NASA has recently actually done away with limits because they were really concerned about lifetime limits, lifetime exposure, because these are government employees and as in part of doing their jobs, the longer they're up in space, the more damage their bodies is gonna accumulate from radiation. So in answer to your question is, we don't know how long you can live in space and radiation and, and survive. We don't know, nobody's ever done it. The trips to the moon that were outside of low Earth orbit in the 60s and 70s, they were up there for a matter of a few days. Now when we're going back to the moon with the Artemis program, started by the Trump administration, and I'm so pleased that the current administration has continued because I tell you, NASA's gotten whiplash going back and forth between different kinds of mission. We're going back to the moon. The longest mission they're thinking about is, it, we'll start with 30 days. 30 days exposed to galactic cosmic rays? Nobody's ever done that before. We don't know the answer to that. Oh, I can't wait to be on that mission. <laughs> can't wait to be. Um, all right, what, what do we do to mitigate the, the psychological factors? Um, because it, it, it it really would be bad to be in some place with other people for three years. Um, and what, what are some of the things that astronauts deal with up there? 
Yeah, so right now, nobody's ever done that before. The closest, so right now when they're on the ISS, or they could pick up the phone and call their wife or their kid, mm -hmm. and they have immediate connection, no time delay. Okay, on a mission to Mars, there's gonna be up to 40 minutes round trip. So you say hi to your wife or your children, and they don't hear you for 20 minutes, and then she says hi back, or why didn't you do the dishes, and then 20 minutes later, you hear it. There is no communication. There's no texting. Think about how frustrated you are when you're waiting for that text back from your kid and they, they're not home yet. Um, so there's no communication. So communication to me is the biggest, the biggest issue. So we are experimenting with a lot of things like this is super tech, like you know, VR experiences, et cetera, where you are feeling like you are immersed in in, in your home. Now, it could backfire on you. Some people may feel more lonesome and more homesick if they recreate their home environment. Other people may like that, so it's highly individualized, but nobody's ever done it. So, so Congressman, the best analog we have is Antarctica. Because when people go to Antarctica, they, I mean, they still can communicate with people outside in the outside world, but it's extremely aus austere, really long, really dangerous conditions. And so that's what we're looking at is Antarctica. Is what about life. the Navy submarine force? They could be underwater for months at a time. You're absolutely right. So the nuclear submarines, right? They go down and they're down there from, it's silent and there's no communication. That's exactly right. So um, yeah, uh, I'd love to hear more about what you think about that. We just tell them to deal with it. <laughs> I mean, that's what, we, that's what we tell them to do. We just deal with it. Well, what's interesting is, you know, there's higher morale um, on a submarine, generally speaking, than a surface ship. And why is that? It doesn't make sense. You get to see the sun on a surface ship, but submarine force generally has higher morale. Yeah. Um, maybe because there's more of a mission. They, they feel like they're, they're more elite. There's more of a mission. Um, maybe better leadership, a number of things. They also have better food. They actually have better food on submarines. It's well known to have the best food. So... It's really important, for, important. Bio, for mental health. Yeah. It's not just nutrition, it's, it's mental health. Um, so that's another problem for us because we, I don't think we're gonna be able to get them Snickers bars. You know, that's oh, a problem. You gotta figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta, um, uh, uh, l l l last question, real quick, because we're out of time, but um, what, are, what are some of the main things that, that we've benefited from here on Earth from y'all's research on, on astronaut healthcare? Yeah, so a lot of the insights that we're making um, in space really have, like, uh, I'll just give you a simple one. How many people here have a home gym? Anybody? Raise your hand. That came from the space program. Uh, the, the, uh, the iPhone or the, the cell phone uh, cameras came from the space program. The insulin pump, the continuous insulin pump came from the space program. CT scans, MRI scans, all images that were stitched together by the Apollo era I'm looking at images of the moon, um, water purifiers, you know, air purifiers. I mean, the list just goes on and on and on and on. In terms of health technologies today, we are, we are making incredible insights because what's happening is, is we're getting to the humans when they're still healthy and the environment is causing an immediate change that is starting down the path of disease and we're learning to prevent it before it becomes a disease. Whereas the healthcare system today gets them when the train wrecks already happen and it is too late. So we are using space, we as a biologist, we're using space as a way to study how to prevent diseases because we've got these really healthy humans that we can actually track really carefully and see, boom, we're gonna intervene right here before osteoporosis kicks in. Those are some brave humans. All right, well, thank you for the work you do. That's amazing, that was really impressive. Thank you.